Welcome to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and today we are honored to have with us Max Lucado. Max entered ministry in 1978, where he served churches in Florida, Brazil, and now he currently resides in Texas, teaching minister at Oak Hills Church in San Antonio. Max is America's best-selling inspirational author with more than 145 million products in print. His latest book is Help Is Here, Finding Fresh Strength and Purpose in the Power of the Holy Spirit. But before we hear from Max, let's go to Ed Setzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Executive Director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. And Daniel Yang is a new author. Daniel, what's the name? An, an, an unalienable? Inalienable. Full inalienable. Subtitle? Inalienable. Right. inalienable. Yep. And so if you put uh, Daniel Yang's books and my books and Max Lucado's books together, we've sold together over 145 million <laughs> copies. Right. I thought I thought you should know that, everybody. So, but we had to work that in. And so we're... Um, but we're gonna. So Mac, Max Lucado has been. I don't know. You for my kids, they remember him as a character, voices of characters. Hermy and Wormy. Uh, there's uh, you know different ways that we've engaged Max Lucado uh, over the years. And but he's got a new book, and it's kind of fascinating uh, because of the topic or the the person who's the topic. And we want to talk about today the work, the, our understanding, and more of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the the actual the actual title of the book is "Help Is Here: Finding Fresh Strength and Purpose in the Power of the Holy Spirit." The book is just out yesterday at the time we're releasing this, and so you can pick it up right now. Again, it's "Help Is Here: Finding Fresh Strength and Purpose in the Power of the Holy Spirit." But we were talking offline, and my my question I was wanted to ask you jokingly is, is Max Lucado the Holy Spirit? I you know I should I call my Pentecostal friends? I mean, should I call Jim Simbola? You know, should I call so? But Max Lucado has brought, well, you tell us about it. What brought you to write something on the Holy Spirit? You, you know, that is a great question because it, there, there is, by the way, thank you so much. Thanks to both of you. I'm, I'm very honored and grateful to have this chance to chat about um, our unfailing friend, the Holy Spirit. Uh, I uh, was not raised to understand. I was not taught a lot about the Holy Spirit. I don't fault the uh, little church where I was raised, the small West Texas congregation. I owned a Bible. I could have read about the Holy Spirit, but had you asked me, uh, I could have explained God the Father and God the Son, but asked me to explain the Holy Spirit. He, I would have given you a blank stare. In, in the book, I do tell about, and I think you'll appreciate this story, uh, when I was in high school. You know, I was, a, I, was a, I was a mess in high school and at college. I was the guy you did not want your daughter to date. I was drunk uh, every, at least three nights, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the way. I was a barroom brawler. I was just a mess. And, uh, and I knew I was a mess. I knew, my, I, I knew that my train was going over the track. And when I was in high school, my senior year of high school, uh, a, an evangelist came to our West Texas town from this far off country called California. <laughs> and it was a, it was the, I have such a vivid memory of a, a school bus that had been painted covered with flowers. Turns out this guy was part of the Jesus movement. Uh, I didn't know what the Jesus movement was, but he would preach in our school parking lot. Uh, and we would, you know, we listened and he invited, we, we were invited to go to home Bible study groups. I can't remember if that's what he called them, but I went. And for the very first time in my whole life, I was taught about the Holy spirit. And I remember having such an interest, such a fascination uh, I was invited even to receive the gift of praying in tongues. I said, yeah, I'll do anything, but nothing happened. And uh, I, I abandoned that pursuit uh, because I, I seriously, I was such a mess that that spiritual fascination lasted about two days. Mm -hmm. And then I was back in my old, my old ways. When I did finally come back to Christ in my early twenties, I did decide to go into ministry. I did end up as a missionary in South America. And I did end up back in San Antonio in my 19, uh, when I, in my early thirties in 1988. And that's when the wheels came off again. I was that pastor who wanted to do everything just right and solve every problem, answer every question and uh, developed insomnia, stressed out. My wife was depressed, clinically depressed. I was a mess. I couldn't sleep at night. 
And that's when I began to understand John 14 of the Holy Spirit as a friend and a comforter. So there was, that's really the, 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 the waypoint or the mile marker for me as a young pastor in my early 30s, beginning to sense the comforting strength as I was downstairs praying in my pajamas, exhausted and worn out, ready to resign, totally frustrated, and began to sense, I'll just say a supernatural strength uh, that, that, that lifted me up. And it wasn't a dramatic thing. He, the Holy Spirit came to me as a friend, more with a whisper than a shout. And I began to sense strength in my day-to-day -day life. And again, it was when I was later studying in John 14, and I saw Jesus calling our comforter, our paraclete, our advocate, that I said, that's, that's who's been helping me. Hmm. And so it, it, it has been this beautiful relationship uh, in the years that have passed. Yeah, I want to I want to talk through what that looks like more. Um, I, I am intrigued, you know, when you come from a tradition. Yeah. I came to Christ in the charismatic movement of the Episcopal Church, so the that tradition was early on in 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 my space. And uh, and um, but when you come from a tradition, and, and that might not emphasize that, which you kind of shared some. Um, even like when you wrote about grace, I kind of thought of it similarly. Yeah. There, there was like yeah. when Max Lucado wants to talk about grace. I wanted to, it was very impactful. That book was a very impactful. Uh, well, more than one you've written in the space on Donna and me both. And then, so I, I love the idea of what Max Lucado is learning and seeing of where the Holy Spirit fits into our, our ministry and mission, you know, our, and our, our focus is church leaders. And we're going to get to that in a moment, but let's talk some about what the unique role of the Holy Spirit and What's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that Max Lucado wants to point us to? Because those are key themes in the book. For, uh, for me, my more recent fascination with the Holy Spirit or uh, pursuit of an understanding of the Holy Spirit comes out of a desperation. Uh, as I look around in, in society and I, after you know, like you said, I've been in ministry since 1979, and um, I, I've I found myself in the last five or six years really weary with the way churches were struggling to connect with society. And in our lifetime, we've tried everything from, you know, seeker sensitive, seeker driven, um, uh, well, we know all the different types of approaches. I've been to every possible different type of seminar. And uh, I, to be quite honest, I, I was getting cynical. And I thought, I don't know if our church uh, is, is going to connect. The churches are going to connect. Given the political climate lately in the last three and four years or five or six years where churches are really becoming increasingly known for their political stance uh, more than their spiritual uh, position that was frustrating continues to be for me so those things working together ed and daniel are what caused me to say why what do we need what do we need to revisit where do we need to go back as a movement as a people well the answer to that for anybody who's read the teachings of Christ is you know before he sends the disciples back to the upper room and says go and wait on the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He would not let them leave until they had received the Holy Spirit. That's such an extraordinary fact. They spent three years with Jesus. If, if anybody ever heard Jesus snore, it was those guys. They had heard everything from, and then they spent 40 days with the resurrected Lord, but they still were not ready. He sends them back to Jerusalem and says, wait until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, that's what activated my return to a serious discussion about the Holy Spirit is that I, I, I don't want another program or church or idea or trend, but I am hungry. I am, I am hungry for just a raindrop of the Holy Spirit to fall upon the church. And I truly believe with all that is within me, and I'll go to my grave believing that the Holy Spirit, our blessed unfailing friend, can do more in a moment than the best preachers and pastors can do, you know, in a lifetime. 
And we just need a great awakening. We, we need that supernatural visitation of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. We cannot coerce it. We cannot force it, but we can request it. And maybe it begins with uh, a great conversation about the wonderful willingness of our unfailing friend to bless the church, the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I'll get preaching and you. No, you no, you're preaching. Yeah. Well, I mean, even the way that you're addressing Holy Spirit as a, you know, faithful friend. I mean, uh, I think so many times we think of Holy Spirit as our ministry consultant, uh, when really Jesus calls uh, Holy Spirit our comforter. I, I like to uh, press into that a little bit more, like the, the friendship of the Holy Spirit. Like, what does that mean? What does that look like? I mean, how do you cultivate that? I mean, what's that been like for you? Yeah. I've been accused of oversimplifying things a lot, so forgive me if this sounds oversimplified, but I, I find great comfort in the story of Jesus in the upper room on the first Easter Sunday after the disciples had locked the door for fear of the Jews, you know, for fear that they would be crucified too, and, uh, and that great Easter declaration that, uh, you know, no, no locked door can hold back the resurrected Christ, and he appears in the upper room. And the first words he says are, peace be unto you, peace be unto you. And then Thomas has his hesitation. And then Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed upon them. He breathed upon them. And so I take from that, that at any point in my life, I can simply inhale what Christ has exhaled, that I can receive the Holy Spirit. Um, I do believe that when I gave my heart to Christ as a young man, I received the Holy Spirit. I just didn't know how to follow him and how to respond to him. And sometimes I think that all of Christianity is reduced down to this one invitation to receive the Holy Spirit. So inhaling him on a regular basis throughout life, through the day to day, I believe is, I think, Daniel, a good answer to your question. You know, what does it mean practically? I, I'm not a big fan of a book that says five ways to receive the Holy Spirit, you know, or 10 tips on following the Holy Spirit. I, those are helpful. They don't really work for me. But what helps me is this whole idea that the Holy Spirit is so willing to give if we will simply request to receive. And so I, I think that my chief assignment as a Christian is to receive the Holy Spirit. And then trust that he will speak through me uh, as, I, as I just go about my day, go about my work. So has there been some sort of like awakening to this for you as you, I know this was something you taught through, yeah. um, but I mean, even you're, you're we, we, I've, known you, I've known you for decades. Um, you were at the conferences, learning the new ways, the new things. And yet you yeah. seem to say now, no, I need to walk in the greater power of the Holy Spirit. Was this an, an awakening, a, a, a new way of thinking of the Holy Spirit for you? It was gradual, Ed. Okay. It was gradual. It was more a gradual discarding of trusting, relying, I shouldn't say trusting, maybe relying on a different angle or different strategy or a different trend, uh, more of uh, discarding that and more of a returning to uh, the power that, that, is, that is described in, in the New Testament. Uh, I, I can look back on some occasions in which I had encounters with the Holy Spirit that are just personal moments mm -hmm. uh, in which I felt like I received a, a, an, an additional gift perhaps of the Holy Spirit. Uh, an, a, a, a unique call or an anointing, uh, very supernatural type uh, of moments, but it's more a gradual takeoff of the airplane than a shoot explosion of a rocket, you know, more of a just, just, just increasingly dependent upon him. And I'm very encouraged. I needed to explore. I needed to understand more and return to the Holy Spirit because I was too dependent upon the right sermons or the right program uh, or, or the right policy or the right politics. I, I had, myself had become that. And so uh, now I find a, a, a joy level and a strength that was missing five or six years ago uh, because I, I, I've 
I think I've gone back to where I needed to be all along. Hmm. You said earlier, we're in a very unique cultural moment, especially for pastors leading churches, and your book is coming at a very timely uh, moment for a lot of pastors, um, because they're asking questions, how do we move our congregations forward post-pandemic and all the cultural upheaval that they're experiencing? And I'm wondering, like, what is it about Holy Spirit in this season of your life that you think, you know, you want to encourage pastors to press in? Um, Yeah. Because it's very easy to move forward in the strategy, and how do we rebuild after post-pandemic, you know, struggles? Um, Is that where they should be, or should they be in the upper room still? Daniel, boy, that is a great question. I think what we're what we're needing, what we're longing for, is a um, a return to a supernatural understanding of heavenly power. Um, we're we're longing and desperate as a people to have uh, encounters with our heavenly Father in the way that he wants to bring about those encounters. And, uh, and yet as a culture, we are super secularized. You know, we just don't believe it. If it doesn't, can't be touched or, or smelled or, or tasted, you know, we, we are completely secularized as a society. And consequently, when our people enter the church on a Sunday, or they go to a small group in the middle of the week, uh, they have been unknowingly conditioned not to believe the unseen or not to trust in the supernatural. And so uh, I, I think if as a pastor, my opportunity right now during these days is to say, look what secularism has done to us. The depression rate is off the charts. The suicide rate is the highest it's been since World War II. Uh, one psychologist said that our children or our young people are going off to college wrapped tighter than Egyptian mummies, that they have the same uh, psychiatric struggles as psychiatric patients of the 1950s. It, it, the stress, the anxiety is just, it's just rocking our boat. And as pastors, this is our opportunity to say, rather than uh, turn to the latest, uh, you know, bestseller, uh, or self-help book. What if we all on our knees turn to God and say, God, we can't fix this. We just can't. But we we have seen what you can do. We saw it. We heard what you said when you stood up and said, if any man come unto me and drink out of his heart or out of him shall flow rivers of living water. This was in reference to the Holy Spirit. So that's what we desire, Lord. So this is Daniel, I think our opportunity as a church to take people in a sense of honest desperation away from all the brouhaha of politics and opinions and say, could we not spend a good season on our knees asking God to do what we saw him do in the great awakenings, what we saw him do in the Welsh revival, what we believe he's so willing to do if we would only humble ourselves and pray. And in the Jesus people movement, since you mentioned that. Jesus. Well. Amen. I love amen. That. I love that. And, and God bless um, that pastor who stood on the top of this bus. <laughs> I know. Oh, gosh, that's so, so <laughs> great. great. We did story. a whole research project and an oral history. If people want to go to Jesus people movement.com, we did an oral history of some of those leaders and uh, partnership with the uh, Wheaton college, Billy Graham center and Biola university. So I, yeah. I, I resonated with that. Um, you know, you mentioned debt coming in desperation. I guess one of the things I like to ask is a little bit about what, pastors and church leaders should have for their expectation as they walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, And I want to give a little context to that. So um, if I remember reading, there was a book published in 1985. Uh, I read read it later, but it was at Indiana University Press, a scholarly look at Oral Roberts' life. I have a little shelf Mm. on of Oral Roberts' history. And this was a scholarly look, um, and it was called Oral Roberts in American Life. People can find it. And I just fascinate reading these things and these, you're like, huh, this, and this, and this. And so, but so much of that was not my experience. Right. Even as I had come to faith in Christ as in a charismatic experience uh, at a charismatic church. Um, so, you know, I, part of, I think, where pastors and church leaders struggle is what should my expectation be? Oral Roberts said he had visions of towers and statues and things that were like, they had, they had dimensions and, and clear directions and, and I have just found that the Lord 
hasn't led me that way. And so my question for you, Max Lucado, is, and this is deeply personal question, what is your expectation for the kind of engagement that you have with the Holy Spirit today? Because maybe that can encourage pastors and church leaders. So we have, I'm not saying your experience is going to be everyone's experience. So we have to know what, what, what can we expect? What does it look like to have that vibrant, filled with the Holy Spirit relationship with him? Hmm. I think, uh, I think we try to answer your question. We try to avoid the extremes, you know, to one extreme is the person who uses their experience with the Holy Spirit as a platform for personal promotion. Uh, there are people who have, uh, they, they come across almost like their buddy, buddy with the Holy Spirit. They have a backstage pass to the Holy Spirit and their ministry consists of elevating themselves over we commoners who have not had that experience. That's a turnoff. Show-offs or turnoffs. That's just a rule of thumb. And then on the other extreme, there is the uh, kind of the self-appointed Holy Spirit sheriff, that, that person who says, if I haven't experienced what you've experienced, then what you've experienced is probably not biblical. And uh, I come out of that background. I, I come out of that history that was very uh, cautious, hesitant, uh, resistant. Uh, and so that, that, that is a real part of the world. So part of the church somewhere in between, however, is that God fearing, uh, scripture, trusting, uh, uh, law, uh, heaven hungry saint who wants to, uh, receive everything that God wants to give acknowledging the authority of scripture. Uh, and acknowledging the immensity of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can work in ways that, that we've never seen. And, and I think creating that sense of we're, we're with, with humble reverence, with authority of Scripture, we're going to lead our church into this adventure of uh, crying out, longing for uh, the Holy Spirit uh, to come and lead us. Uh, I, I, when you were talking, a, a great illustration of that very top thing have, came to my mind, Ed. Uh, of course, you remember Promise Keepers and, yeah. and, and Bill McCartney. Uh, and, and I don't know I, I, all the different backgrounds of the leaders of Promise Keepers, but it was certainly of a more charismatic bent than I was accustomed to. And I, I spoke at several uh, Promise Keeper events, and one of the first ones, maybe the first one or the second one, uh, there was a major issue that surfaced. I think a speaker couldn't make his flight, and there was a big gap uh, in the teaching, and they had to solve a problem. And so they gathered the speakers backstage, and we sat in a circle. And I remember Coach McCartney said, okay, we're going to pray, and we're going to if God tells anybody in this circle what to do, that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. I was unaccustomed to that. <laughs> I was unaccustomed to that, right. man. I was accustomed to, Hey, let's get our best brains together right, and talk right. this through. Right. But you know what? For crying out loud, I couldn't disagree with it. I couldn't say we can't do that. And, and goodness sakes, if the Lord didn't speak through somebody, and somebody said, well, you know, something, here's a solution. And the coach said, okay, that's our direction. The Lord has led us. And, you know, to be quite honest, I read the book of Acts. That might be a little more <laughs> being led by the spirit than my typical approach. So through our lives, through our ministry, I believe the Lord brings us uh, in contact with others who have had yeah. uh, experiences in learning to follow the Holy Spirit that we could all, from which we could all benefit. Okay. So, um, the book, just to remind everyone, is help us here finding fresh strength and purpose in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to press a little more because you gave the example of Bill McCartney and how he did that. And I think that's great, but I would like to hear how personally, uh, Max Lucado is, um, engaging in, uh, that's you, you know, what, what does it look like? How, how does the Holy Spirit guide you? How does the Holy Spirit uh, comfort you? How do you find fresh strength and purpose from the Holy Spirit? Again, that's the subtitle of the book. Again, it's Help Us Here, Finding Fresh Strength and Purpose 
in the power of the Holy Spirit specifically helps set, I, I, again, as you said, everyone's experience may be different, um, but your experience may help us have expectations of what someone who's really leaned in on the Holy Spirit in a book, what that might look like. So talk to us about that a little bit. I am more confident than I've ever been in my life that the Holy Spirit will guide me and he tends to guide me through my thoughts. Okay. I shouldn't be surprised by that. He created me. He, he owns me. He indwells me. And so um, I am more convinced than ever that if I say, Heavenly Father, should I say yes to this or no? Uh, and then I sit quietly for a few moments, I will have an answer surface in my mind. Mm. And I follow that. I follow it. Uh, I've, I've, come, I've come to trust that. Uh, I believe also more than ever that the Holy Spirit takes all of my prayers and turns them into intercessions worthy of the audience of the triune God. Uh, I believe it is so encouraging that the Apostle Paul said, we do not know how to pray as we ought. Thank you, Paul, because if you don't know how to pray as you mm. ought, I don't know how to pray. And if yeah. the power of prayer resides upon the one who prays, then I'm really sunk because I don't even know what to say. But to think that the Holy Spirit, one of the role of the Holy Spirit is to be an advocate or an intercessor in Romans chapter 8, that he takes our prayers and presents them in the presence of God. That really has, uh, Daniel and Ed, empowered my prayers. Sometimes my mind wanders when I pray. Sometimes I feel like I, I can't quite collect my thoughts when I pray. And, uh, and so to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is doing this for me is, is remarkable. And then the third uh, most significant, well, I would say not the most, but a significant uh, gift came my way. And this will surprise a lot of the audience. It already has sure surprised our church. Uh, but, you know, when I was 64, uh, on a July morning, as I was praying, I began praying in tongues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, I had taken serious, I had not done anything different, except uh, I came across the passage where the Apostle Paul said, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. And I guess I thought, oh, I had all the gifts that I was supposed to have given to me when I became a Christian. Well, maybe so, maybe. But he says, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. So I said, Lord, is there any other gift you desire from me? And I, I prayed that every morning for two or three weeks. And then one morning, early in the morning, I began praying uh, in a heavenly language. Again, I had been taught those languages were discontinued. And I really am not raising this topic so somebody can send me an email. Okay, I'm really not. I think I've, we're, I'm, the Restoration Herald is writing an article right now. So, I, I, you know, I get it. And if that, you know, I'm, I'm not advocating one way or the other. But I will say that it is just a tender moment every morning yeah. when I enjoy. So you regularly moment. now pray in tongues as part of your prayer time? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, were you, do you consider that you experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that time? You said earlier that uh, you received the Holy Spirit at conversion. Do you see that as a baptism of the Holy Spirit, or is that a subsequent filling with some gifts? How would you describe that? You know, when people ask me if, uh, do, I, do I think that there is a uh, post-conversion experience right. of the Holy Spirit? Uh, and, and my answer is, I think there is, but not just one. Okay. I think there's almost daily, right? I'm, I think I received a post-conversion experience this morning and in prayer time, you know, uh, I, I believe that there is that fresh feeling that comes as we do our best to, to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Uh, to me, that was a very unique. Now, uh, can I be really quick to add? Uh, and I really point this out. I tell that story in the book, but I'm right, very careful to say, uh, that doesn't make me a better Christian. That doesn't right. make me a better believer. I don't ever display that gift. I believe the Apostle Paul, in fact, really encouraged the church in Corinth to keep that in perspective. He would rather preach, what was the phrase, uh, with a thousand words they could understand than five, I think I had it backwards, five words they could understand than a thousand <laughs> they couldn't. So right. I'm doing, 
I don't make a big deal out of that. Right. I never mention it. I've, ne I've mentioned it with our church one time, uh, but I've, I don't display it. Uh, I, I don't, in fact, I, I, I'm sitting here talking, should I have even mentioned it on the podcast? Cause I don't want to come across like I've heard others come across like, oh, I'm a super saint now that I have right. this mm -hmm. gift. But that, I think that is a fair answer to your question yeah. of, of how I, my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that's part of why I wanted to press is because I think, um, I think to, first of all, that, that is, I mean, that will, people will talk about that. I think that's a significant bit of information that, uh, you know, a restoration movement pastor who's been, you know, basically a low church evangelical. I mean, when I was at your church, you had a, you know, had an acapella service, you probably still have the more early acapella service. And I mean, your, your church is, is got a journey of evangel from, you know, church of Christ into this evangelical space. That is a significant development of your understanding of the Holy Spirit that I, I think a lot of people will find very interesting, which is why we keep, I was asking about, was this, or I think you asked about, was there some sort of awakening or something that's there. So what would you say, because, you know, I, I have friends who've, uh, you know, sought, uh, you mentioned when the Jesus People Movement preacher came, you you prayed to receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues then, and you didn't. So what would you say to pastors and church leaders say, man, I want all that the Holy Spirit has for me. Uh, mm -hmm. What should I do? How, how should I seek all the face of God, the filling of the Spirit, and all the Holy Spirit has for for me. Yeah. I think a childlike faith is really the soil uh, in which the seeds of the Holy Spirit are best sown. A childlike faith that says, whatever you want to give me. I know my wife has requested uh, uh, several, uh, she has requested the same and has received different gifts uh, th than I have. She has a really powerful sense of discernment. She picks up on uh, I think the presence of a, a demonic force uh, that that I don't even notice, and and so she's very quick to uh, point things out. Gift of discernment, uh huh. Some of the uh, gifts like that. So I, I I do I do believe that uh, it was not a happy day when uh, uh, the evangelical movement began to squabble about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think in order for us to see revival, there needs to be a reunion, a, a coming together, an acknowledgement that none of us, I mean, for, for anybody to say they understand all the work of the wonderful Holy Spirit is to say that somebody can take the Pacific Ocean and put it in a thimble. That ain't going to happen. Yeah. You've had your experience. I have mine. Let's acknowledge that our Holy Spirit is, is active and, and working. And as pastors, I believe we can continue to say, Lord, do I, am I receiving everything you want to give me? I'm open. I'm thrilled with what you've given me. If I receive nothing else, wonderful. But if you have another uh, strength, a gift of hospitality or a gift of teaching, if you're going to strengthen this or that, please, I'm just available. So I think that's the attitude that we have to take. And even in your story, and I hear this uh, with other pastors and Christians who are later in life and maturing and but they get to this point of desperation and it becomes about a reinvestigation of who am i lord and and um and you brought up this word earlier anxiety um and i think a big part of uh maybe what i'm hearing you saying is that there's there are things that holy spirit can tell you about yourself that nobody else can and um i'm thinking about pastors and leaders right now where the internal critic is very strong. The external critics are very strong, and that's forming their primary imagination about who they are. Um, and how, how how might they listen in to the Holy Spirit about truth about who they are and and their identity in Christ? Remember Paul's promise or this announcement that the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Uh, I believe the Holy Spirit comes carrying the love of God into our hearts. Uh, and that he wants to deposit that love deeper and deeper into our one of one of his assignments is to to be the seal of the saint, you know, to secure us uh, for salvation uh, and to know that my salvation is secure, that I'm loved by God and cherished by God really puts me in a posture where I can I can stand up and I can I can address the church. 
uh, this voice, this inner critic voice is one of those voices that we have to uh, bring before the judgment seat of Christ on a regular basis. You know, we take every thought captive, bring it in front of the judgment seat of Christ. And we say, Lord Jesus, is this, is this you telling me that I'm not any good at this? Uh, I don't think that's the tone of you, Lord. Where's it coming from? Would you please speak? And so uh, speaking to Jesus about these critical voices that have come into our minds and allowing him to do what he through his Holy Spirit is so willing to do to be that comforter, to be that advocate and to trust him to do so is, is, is really, really important. Um, as long as I'm confessing all my many sins and getting everything out in the open, <laughs> uh, you know, I regularly say, Lord, help me to, uh, resist temptation of, uh, looking at women the wrong way, disrespectfully. Um, I'm very sorry, Lord. I'm very sorry that when I saw that lady who cut my hair the other day, I just couldn't quit looking at, about how pretty she is. And, and, and I'm sorry about it. And I'm telling you guys, my brothers, I'm sorry. But the Holy Spirit is helping me in this area of my life. Nobody take this, please. I'm not doing anything. I'm not involved in anything. I'm just talking about how, how, how I, ha I have learned to go quickly to the Holy Spirit and say, I'm so sorry uh, about my attitude or, 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 or the thoughts that I had. Uh, would you please help me? Would you please help me? And what I'm finding is if I stay in communion with the Holy Spirit, Instead of seeing the Holy Spirit as the head coach who sends me out on the field to run the play alone, and then I come back and report to him to get the next play. But if I can see him as Jesus wants me to see him as my comforter, my advocate, the paraclete, the one who's right beside me, then I'm in complete, even as we're having this interview, I want to, I want to say, Holy Spirit, am I saying what you need me to say? Am I following in step with you. And I'm finding renewed strength, renewed discipline uh, for some of these uh, temptations that have dogged me all of my life. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. And, and I'm thankful for our conversation today. It's been, it's been transparent and helpful. Um, and I don't, you know, I want to recognize too that we, you, you rely a lot. And again, the book is called Help Is Here. A lot of it has to be the Holy Spirit is helper. And then finding fresh strength, a lot of deal with strength, uh, purpose, and more. Um, and and some deals with spiritual gifts. We mentioned speaking in tongues. Um, but you also talk some about the, how do we, you know, gifts of the Holy Spirit. You talked about your wife and having gifts of discernment. Um, how do we, as pastors and church leaders, you know, our audience, how do we help people access and walk in uh, the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I think, first of all, we remind our church that our faith is inherently supernatural. Uh, unlike other religions that follow the teachings of a dead leader uh, or unlike secularism that follows just the collective opinion of a society, uh, we believe that the same God who created the universe that we're seeing so much more clearly now, thanks to the Webb telescope, the God who created all of that is ready to talk to us. And so if again, I go back to the fact that our churches live in a secular society and have unknowingly been conditioned to think in a secular mindset. And so we, we need to remind the church, we are a supernatural people. We are a people who believes in an unseen God. And so we, we make that announcement. And then I think we help people understand the personality of the spirit, that the spirit is a person that the spirit is a power, that the spirit is strength. I did read uh, one, one uh, Lifeway research uh, tool that said three out of five Christians do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a person, but more of an impersonal power. And that's unfortunate. Uh, you know, how do you have a relationship with electricity? Uh, but if the Holy Spirit is as who he is, a, a person, then we need to educate our churches and edu remind ourselves that he he has he can be quenched, uh, he can be angered, uh, he 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 can be uh, abandoned, he can be denied, and so all of these things we can do to a person, we can do to a spirit, 
And then number three, I think, I think inviting people to make sure they have explored the gifts of the spirit and that they're walking and serving out of their unique gift mix or unique gifting is simply being a good steward of, of what God uh, has given to each one of us. Those are hmm. just two or three ideas. Good ones. Yeah, you've been listening to the words and wisdom of Max Lucado. Be sure to check out his latest book, Help is Here, Finding Fresh Strength and Purpose in the Power of the Holy Spirit. And you can learn more about Max at maxlucado.com. And thanks again for listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review that'll help other leaders find and benefit from our content more easily. We'll see you in the next episode.